Chapter Thirty Six of the Burgess Animal Book for Children. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recorded by Laurie Ann Walden. The Burgess Animal Book for Children by Thornton W. Burgess. Chapter Thirty Six Bugler, Flathorns, and Wanderhoof. The Elk or Wapiti, Moose or Caribou. Lightfoot the deer was the first one on hand the next morning. In fact, he arrived before sun-up, and, lying down in a little thicket close at hand, made himself very comfortable to wait for the opening of school. You see, not for anything would he have missed that lesson about his big cousins. There the others found him when they arrived. The deer family, began Old Mother Nature, is divided into two branches, the round-horned and the flat-horned. I have told you about the round-horned deer with the exception of the largest and noblest, Bugler the Elk. He is commonly called Elk, but his right name is Wapiti. Bugler is found only in the great mountains of the far west, but once, before hunters with terrible guns came, Elk were found in nearly all parts of this country excepting the far south and the far north, even on the great plains. Now Bugler lives only in the forests of the great mountains. "'How big is he?' asked Lightfoot. "'So big that beside him you would look very small,' replied Old Mother Nature. "'Have you ever seen Farmer Brown's horse?' Lightfoot nodded. "'Well, Bugler stands as high as that horse,' replied Old Mother Nature. "'He isn't as heavy, for his body is of different shape, not so big around. "'But at that he weighs three times as much as you do.' In summer his coat is a light yellowish-brown, becoming very dark on his neck and underneath. His legs are dark brown. The hair on his neck is long and coarse. His tail is very small, and around it is a large patch so light in color as to be almost whitish. In winter his coat becomes dark gray. Bugler's crowning glory are his antlers. They are very large and wide-spreading, sweeping backward and upward, the long prongs or tines, curving upward from the front instead of from the back, as in the case of Lightfoot's antlers. Above each eye is a long, sharp prong. So big are these antlers that Bugler looks almost as if he were carrying a small, bare tree on his head. Big as these antlers are, they are grown in a few months, for Bugler is like his small cousins in that he loses his antlers at the end of every winter, and must grow a new pair. While they are growing, he hides in the wildest places he can find, high up on the mountains. Mrs. Bugler is at that time down in a valley with her baby or babies. Usually she has one, but sometimes twins. She has no antlers. In the fall, when his antlers have hardened, Bugler moves down to join his family. The bigger and stronger he is, the bigger his family is, for he has a number of wives, and they all live together in a herd or band of which Bugler is lord and master. He is ready and eager to fight for them, and terrible battles take place when another disputes his leadership. At this season he has a habit of stretching his neck out and emitting a far-reaching trumpet-like sound from which he gets the name of Bugler. It is a warning that he is ready to fight. When the snows of winter come, many families get together and form great bands. Then they move down from the mountains in search of shelter and food. When a winter is very bad, many starve to death for man has fenced in and made into farms much of the land where the elk once found ample food for winter. But big as is Bugler the elk, there is a cousin who is bigger, the biggest of all the deer family. It is Flathorns the moose. As you must guess by his name, he is a member of the flat-horned branch of the family. His antlers spread widely and are flattened instead of being round. From the edges of the flattened part many sharp points spring out. Flathorns, wearing his crown of great spreading antlers, is a noble-appearing animal because of his great size, but when his antlers have dropped he is a homely fellow. Mrs. Flathorns, who has no antlers, is very homely. As I have said, Flathorns is the biggest member of the deer family. He is quite as big as Farmer Brown's horse, and stands much higher at the shoulders. Indeed, his shoulders are so high that he has a decided hump there for they are well above the line of his back. His neck is very short, large, and thick, 
and his head is not at all like the heads of other members of the deer family. Instead of the narrow, pointed face of other members of the deer family, he has a broad, long face, rather more like that of a horse. Towards the nose it humps up, and the great thick upper lip overhangs the lower one. His nose is very broad, and for his size his eyes are small. His ears are large. From his throat hangs a hairy fold of skin called a bell. He has a very short tail, so short that it is hardly noticeable. His legs are very long and rather large. His hoofs are large and rounded, more like those of Bossy the cow than like those of Lightfoot the deer. Seen at a little distance in the woods, he looks to be almost black, but really is for the most part dark brown. His legs are gray on the inside. Flathorns lives in the great northern forests, clear across the country, and is especially fond of swampy places. He is fond of the water, and is a good swimmer. In summer he delights to feed on the pads, stems, and roots of water lilies, and his long legs enable him to wade out to get them. For the most part his food consists of leaves and tender twigs of young trees, such as striped maple, aspen, birch, hemlock, alder, and willow. His great height enables him to reach the upper branches of young trees. When they are too tall for this, he straddles them and bends or breaks them down to get at the upper branches. His front teeth are big, broad, and sharp-edged. With these he strips the bark from the larger branches. He also eats grass and moss. Because of his long legs and short neck, he finds it easiest to kneel when feeding on the ground. Big as he is, he can steal through thick growth without making a sound. He does not jump like other deer, but travels at an awkward trot which takes him over the ground very fast. In the winter when snow is deep, the moose family lives in a yard such as I told you Lightfoot makes. The greatest enemy of Flathorns is the hunter, and from being much hunted, Flathorns has learned to make the most of his ears, eyes, and nose. He is very smart and not easily surprised. When wounded, he will sometimes attack man, and occasionally when not wounded. Then he strikes with his sharp-edged front hoofs, and they are terrible weapons. Altogether, he is a wonderful animal, and it is a matter for sorrow that man persists in hunting him merely to get his wonderful head. In parts of these same northern forests lives another big member of the deer family, Wanderhoof, the woodland caribou. He is bigger than Lightfoot the deer, but smaller than Bugler the elk, rather an awkward-looking fellow. His legs are quite long, but stout. His neck is rather short, and instead of carrying his head proudly, as does Lightfoot, he carries it stretched out before him, or hanging low. The hair on the lower part of his neck is long. Wanderhoof wears a coat of brown, his neck being much lighter or almost gray. He has an undercoat which is very thick and woolly. In winter his whole coat becomes grayish and his neck white. Above each hoof is a band of white. His tail is very short and white on the underside. His antlers are wonderful, being very long and both round and flat. That is, parts of them are round and parts flattened. They have more prongs than those of any other deer. His hoofs are very large, deeply slit, and cup-shaped. When he walks they make a snapping or clicking sound. These big feet were given him for a purpose. He is very fond of boggy ground, and because of these big feet and the fact that the hooves spread when he steps, he can walk safely where others would sink in. This is equally true in snow when they serve as snowshoes. As a result, he is not forced to live in yards as are Lightfoot and Flathorns when the snow is deep, but goes where he pleases. He is very fond of the water and delights to splash about in it, and is a splendid swimmer. His hair floats him so that when swimming he is higher out of the water than any other member of the family. In winter he lives in the thickest parts of the forest among the hemlocks and spruces, and feeds on the mosses and lichens which grow on the trees. In summer he moves to the open, boggy ground around shallow lakes where moss covers the ground, and on this he lives. He is a great wanderer, hence his name Wanderhoof. Mrs. Caribou has antlers, wherein she differs from Mrs. Lightfoot, Mrs. Flathorns, and Mrs. Bugler. Wanderhoof is fond of company, and usually is found with many companions of his own kind. When they are moving from their summer home to their winter home, or back again, 
they often travel in very large bands. In the far north, beyond the great forests, Wanderhoof has a cousin who looks very much like him, called the barren ground caribou. This name comes from the fact that way up there little excepting moss grows, and on this the caribou lives. In summer this caribou is found almost up to the Arctic Ocean, moving southward in great herds as the cold weather approaches. No other animals of today get together in such great numbers. In the extreme north is another caribou, called Peary's caribou, whose coat is wholly white. The caribou are close cousins of the reindeer, and look much like them. All male members of the smaller deer are called bucks. The female members are called does, and the young are called fawns. All male members of the big deer, such as Bugler the elk, Flathorns the moose, and Wanderhoof the caribou, are called bulls. The females are called cows, and the young are called calves. All members of the deer family, with the exception of the barren ground caribou, are forest-loving animals and are seldom seen far from the sheltering woods. This, I think, will do for the deer family. Tomorrow I shall tell you about Thunderfoot the bison, Fleetfoot the antelope, and Longcoat the musk ox. End of chapter 36「Thirty Seven of the Burgess Animal Book for Children. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recorded by Laurie Ann Walden. The Burgess Animal Book for Children by Thornton W. Burgess. Chapter 37. Thunderfoot, Fleetfoot, and Longcoat. The Buffalo or Bison, Antelope, and muskox. "'Who remembers the name of the order to which all members of the deer family belong?' asked Old Mother Nature. "'I remember what it means, but not the name,' spoke up Happy Jack Squirrel. "'It means hoofed.' "'It is un 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 began Peter Rabbit, and then stopped. For the life of him he couldn't think of the rest. un Old Mother Nature finished for him. "'And Happy Jack has the meaning right.' It is the order to which all hoofed animals belong. There are several families in the order, one of which you have already learned about, the deer family. Now comes the family of cattle and sheep. It is called the Bovidae family, and the biggest and most important member is Thunderfoot the bison, commonly called buffalo. Thunderfoot is more closely related to Bossy, Farmer Brown's cow, than are the members of the deer family, for he has true horns, not antlers. These are hollow and are not dropped each year, but are carried through life. Mrs. Thunderfoot has them also. The horns grow out from the sides of the forehead and then curve upward and inward, and are smooth and sharp. They are never branched. Thunderfoot is a great, heavy fellow the size of Farmer Brown's ox, and has a great hump on his shoulders. He carries his head low, and from his throat hangs a great beard. His head is large, and is so covered with thick curly hair that it appears much larger than it really is. His tail is rather short, and ends in a tassel of hair. The hair on his body and hindquarters is short and light brown, but on his shoulders and neck and his forelegs to the knees it is long and shaggy, dark brown above, and almost black below. "'He must be a queer-looking fellow,' spoke up Chatterer the Red Squirrel. He is, replied Old Mother Nature. The front half of him looks so much bigger than the rear half that it almost seems as if they didn't belong together. What does he eat? asked Jumper the Hare. Grass, replied Old Mother Nature promptly. He grazes just as does Bossy. When the weather becomes hot, his thick coat, although much of it has been shed, becomes most uncomfortable. Also he is tormented by flies. Then he delights in rolling in mud until he is plastered with it from head to feet. Many years ago there were more bison than any other large animal in this country, and they were found in nearly all parts of it. Some lived in the woods and were called wood buffaloes, but the greatest number lived on the great plains and prairies, where the grass was plentiful. I have told you about the great herd of barren ground caribou, but this is nothing to the great herds of bison that used to move north or south, according to the season, across the great prairies. In the fall they moved south. In the spring they moved north, 
following the new grass as it appeared. When they galloped, the noise of their feet was like thunder. But the hunters with terrible guns came and killed them for their skins, killed them by hundreds of thousands, and in just a few years those great herds became only a memory. Thunderfoot, once lord of the prairies, was driven out of all his great kingdom, and the bison, from being the most numerous of all large animals, is today reduced to just a few hundreds, and most of these are kept in parks by man. Barely in time did man make laws to protect Thunderfoot. Without this protection he would not exist today. A close neighbor of Thunderfoot's in the days when he was lord of the prairies was Fleetfoot the antelope. Fleetfoot is about the size of a small deer, and in his graceful appearance reminds one of Lightfoot, for he has the same trim body and long slim legs. He is built for speed and looks it. From just a glance at him you would know him for a runner, just as surely as a look at Jumper the Hare would tell you that he must travel in great bounds. The truth is, Fleetfoot is the fastest runner among all my children in this country. Not one can keep up with him in a race. Fleetfoot's coat is a light yellowish brown on the back and white underneath. His forehead is brown and the sides of his face white. His throat and underside of his neck are white, crossed by two bands of brown. His hoofs, horn, and eyes are black, and there is a black spot under each ear. Near the end of his nose he is also black, and down the back of his neck is a black line of stiff longer hairs. A large white patch surrounds his short tail. Who remembers what I told you about Antelope Jack, the big Jack Hare of the Southwest? I do, cried Peter Rabbit and Jumper the Hare together. What was it, Jumper? asked Old Mother Nature. You said that he has a way of making the white of his side seem to grow so that he seems almost all white, and can signal his friends in this way, replied Jumper. Quite right, replied Old Mother Nature. I am glad to find that you remember so well. Fleetfoot does the same thing with this white patch around his tail. The hairs are quite long, and he can make them spread out so that the white patch becomes much larger, and when he is running it can be seen flashing in the sun long after he is so far away that nothing else of him can be seen. His eyes are wonderfully keen, so by means of these white patches he and his friends can signal each other when they are far apart. Fleetfoot has true horns, but they are unlike any other horns in that they are shed every year, just like the antlers of the deer family. They grow straight up just over the eyes, are rather short, and fork. One branch is much shorter than the other, and the longer one is turned over at the end like a hook. From these horns he gets the name of pronghorn. When running from danger he carries his head low and makes long leaps. When not frightened, he trots and holds his head high and proudly. He prefers flat, open country, and there is no more beautiful sight on all the great plains of the West than a band of Fleetfoot and his friends. He is social, and likes the company of his own kind. The time was when these beautiful creatures were almost as numerous as the bison, but like the latter they have been killed until now there is real danger that unless man protects them better than he is doing, there will come a day when the last antelope will be killed, and one of the most beautiful and interesting of all my children will be but a memory. There was a note of great sadness in old Mother Nature's voice. For a few minutes no one spoke. All were thinking of the terrible thing that had happened at the hands of man to the great hosts of two of the finest animals in all this great land, the bison and antelope, and there was bitterness in the heart of each one, for there was not one there who did not himself have cause to fear man. Old Mother Nature was the first to break the silence. Now, said she, I will tell you of the oddest member of the cattle and sheep family. It is Longcoat, the musk ox, and he appears to belong wholly neither to the cattle nor the sheep branch of the family, but to both. He connects the two branches in appearance, reminding one somewhat of a small bison, and at the same time having things about him very like a sheep. Longcoat the musk ox lives in the farthest north, the land of snow and ice. He has been found very near the Arctic Ocean, and how he finds enough to eat in the long winter is a mystery to those who know that snow-covered land. 
He is a heavily built, round-bodied animal with short, stout legs, shoulders so high that they form a hump, a low-hung head and sheep-like face, heavy horns, which are flat and broad at the base, and meet at the center of the forehead, sweeping down on each side of the head, and then turning up in sharp points. His tail is so short that it is hidden in the long hair which covers him. This hair is so long that it hangs down on each side, so that often it touches the snow, and hides his legs nearly down to his feet. In color it is very dark brown, almost black, and on his sides is straight. But on his shoulders it is curly. In the middle of the back is a patch of shorter, dull gray hair. Underneath this coat of long hair is another coat of woolly, fine, light brown hair, so close that neither cold nor rain can get through it. It is this warm coat that makes it possible for him to live in that terribly cold region. He is about twice as heavy as a big deer. At times he gives off a musky odor, and it is from this that he gets his name of musk ox. Long coat is seldom found alone, but usually with a band of his friends. This is partly for protection from his worst enemies, the wolves. When the latter appear, Longcoat and his friends form a circle with their heads out, and it is only a desperately hungry wolf that will try to break through that line of sharp-pointed horns. In rough, rocky country he is as sure-footed as a sheep. In the short summer of that region he finds plenty to eat, but in winter he has to paw away the snow to get at the moss and other plants buried beneath it. Practically all other animals living so far north have white coats, but Longcoat retains his dark coat the year through. My, how time flies! This is all for today. Tomorrow I will tell you of two wonderful mountain climbers who go with ease where even man cannot follow. End of chapter 37「Chapter thirty eight of the Burgess Animal Book for Children. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Claire Gauget. The Burgess Animal Book for Children by Thornton W. Burgess. Chapter thirty eight. To Wonderful Mountain Climbers The Rocky Mountain Sheep or Bighorn and the Rocky Mountain Goat. "'Peter, you have been up in the old pasture many times, so you must have seen the sheep there,' said Old Mother Nature, turning to Peter Rabbit. "'Certainly, of course,' replied Peter. "'They seem to me rather stupid creatures. Anyway, they look stupid.' "'Then you know the leader of the flock, the big ram with curling horns,' continued Old Mother Nature. Peter nodded, and Old Mother Nature went on. "'Just imagine him with a smooth coat of grayish-brown instead of a white woolly one.' and immense curling horns many times larger than those he now has. Give him a large whitish or very light yellowish patch around a very short tail. Then you will have a very good idea of one of those mountain climbers I promised to tell you about, one of the greatest mountain climbers in all of the great world. Bighorn the Mountain Sheep, also called Rocky Mountain Bighorn and Rocky Mountain Sheep. Bighorn is a true sheep, and lives high among the rocks of the highest mountains of the far west. Like all members of the order to which he belongs, his feet are hoofed, but they are hoofs which never slip, and he delights to bound along the edges of great cliffs, and in making his way up or down them, where it looks as if it would be impossible for even Chatterer the Red Squirrel to find footing, to say nothing of such a big fellow as Bighorn. The mountains where he makes his home are so high that the tops of many of them are in the clouds, and covered with snow even in summer. Above the line where trees can no longer grow, Bighorn spends his summers, coming down to the lower hills only when the snow becomes so deep that he cannot paw down through it to get food. His eyesight is wonderful, and from his high lookout he watches for enemies below, and small chance have they of approaching him from that direction. When alarmed, he bounds away gracefully, as if there were great springs in his legs, and his great curled horns are carried as easily if they were nothing at all. 
down rock slopes so steep that a single misstep would mean a fall hundreds of feet, he bounds as swiftly and easily as Lightfoot the deer bounds, through the woods leaping from one little jutting point of rock to another, and landing securely as if he were on level ground. He climbs with equal ease where man would have to crawl, and cling with fingers and toes, or give up altogether. Mrs. Bighorn does not have the great curling horns. Instead, she is armed with short, sharp-pointed horns like spikes. Her young are born in the highest, most inaccessible place she can find, and there they have little to fear save one enemy, King Eagle. Only such an enemy, one with wings, can reach them there. Bighorn and Mrs. Bighorn, because of their size, nothing to dread from these great birds. But helpless little lambs are continually in danger of furnishing King Eagle with the dinner he prizes. Only when driven to the lower slopes and hills by storms and snow does Bighorn have cause to fear four-footed enemies. Then Puma the panther must be watched for, and lower down Howler the wolf. But Bighorn's greatest enemy, and one he fears most, is the same one so many others have sad cause to fear, the hunter with his terrible gun. The terrible gun can kill where man himself cannot climb, and Bighorn has been persistently hunted for his head and wonderful horns. Some people believe that Bighorn leaps from cliffs and alights on those great horns, but this is not true. Whenever he leaps, he alights on those sure feet of his, not on his head. Way up in the extreme northwest corner of this country, in a place called Alaska, is a close cousin whose coat is all white and whose horns are yellow and more slender and wider spreading. He is called a doll mountain sheep. Farther south, but not as far south as the home of Bighorn, is another cousin whose coat is so dark that he is sometimes called the black mountain sheep. His proper name is Stone's Mountain Sheep. In the mountains between these two is another cousin with a white head and dark body called Fannin's Sheep. All these cousins are closely related, and in their habits are much alike. Of them all, Bighorn the Rocky Mountain Sheep is the best known. I should think, said Peter Rabbit, that way up there on those high mountains Bighorn would be very lonesome. Old Mother Nature laughed. Bighorn doesn't care for neighbors as you do, Peter, said she. But even up in those high rocky retreats, among the clouds, he has a neighbor as sure-footed as himself, one who stays winter as well as summer on the mountain tops. It is Billy the Rocky Mountain Goat. Billy is as awkward-looking as he moves about as Bighorn is graceful, but he will go where even Bighorn will hesitate to follow. His hoofs are small and especially planned for walking in safety on smooth rock and ice-covered ledges. In weight he's about equal to Lightfoot the deer, but he doesn't look in the least like him. In the first place, he has a hump on his shoulders much like the humps of Thunderfoot the bison and Longcoat the musk ox. Of course this means that he carries his head low. His face is very long, and from beneath his chin hangs a white beard. From his forehead two rather short, slim black horns stand up with a little curve backward. His coat is white, and the hair is long and straight. Under this long white coat he wears a thick coat of short, woolly, yellowish-white fur, which keeps him warm in the coldest weather. He seldom leaves his beloved mountain-tops, even in the worst weather of winter, as Bighorn sometimes does, but finds shelter among the rocks. The result is that he has practically no enemy save man to fear. Often he spends the summer where the snow remains all the year through, and his white coat is a protection from the keenest eyes. You see, when not moving, he looks in the distance for all the world like a patch of snow on the rocks. Not having a handsome head or wonderful horns, he has not been hunted by man quite so much as Bighorn, and therefore is not so alert and wary. Both he and Bighorn are more especially approached from above than from below, because they do not expect danger from above, and so do not keep so sharp a watch in that direction. The young are sometimes taken by King Eagle, but otherwise Billy Goat's family has little to fear from enemies, always expecting the hunter with his terrible gun. I have now told you of the members of the cattle and sheep family, what they look like, and where they live and how. There is still one more member of the order Ungulata, and this one is in a way related to another member of Farmer Brown's barnyard. I will leave you to guess which one. 
"'What is it, Peter?' "'If you please, in just what part of the far west are the mountains where Billy Goat lives?' replied Peter. "'Chiefly in the northern part,' replied Old Mother Nature. "'In the northwest these mountains are very close to the ocean, and Billy does not appear to mind in the least the fogs that roll in, and seems to enjoy the salt air. Sometimes there he comes down almost to the shore. Are there any more questions?' There were none, so school was dismissed for the day. Peter didn't go straight home. Instead, he went up to the old pasture for another look at the old ram there, and tried to picture to himself just what Bighorn must look like. Especially he looked at the hoofs of the old ram. "'It is queer,' muttered Peter, "'how feet like those can be so safe up on those slippery rocks old Mother Nature told us about. Anyway, it seems queer to me. But it must be so if she says it is.' "'My, my, my, what a lot of strange people there are in this world, and what a lot there is to learn!' End of chapter 38「Piggy and Hard Shell, the Peccary, or Wild Pig and the Armadillo. All the way to school the next morning, Peter Rabbit did his best to guess who it might be that they were to learn about that day. Old Mother Nature said that he is related to someone who lives in Farmer Brown's barnyard, said Peter to himself. Now, who can it be? But try as he would, Peter couldn't think of anyone. He asked Jumper the Hare if he had guessed who it could be. Jumper shook his head. I haven't the least idea, said he. You know, I seldom leave the green forest, and I never have been over to that barnyard in my life. So, of course, I don't know who lives there. Danny Meadow Mouse and Whitefoot, the wood mouse, were no wiser, nor was Johnny Chuck. But Chatterer, the red squirrel, it was plain to see, was quite sure he knew who it was. Chatterer had been over to Farmer Brown so often to steal corn from the corn crib that he knew all about that barnyard and who lived there. But though Peter and the others teased him to tell them, he wouldn't. So when old Mother Nature asked who had guessed to whom she had referred, Chatterer was the only one to reply. I think you must have meant the pig, who is always rooting about and grunting in that barnyard, said he. Your guess is right, Chatterer, she replied, smiling at the little red-coated rascal. And this morning I will tell you a little about a relative of his, who doesn't live in a barnyard, but lives in the forest as free and independent as you are. It is Piggy, the peccary, known as the collared peccary, also called wild pig, muskhog, Texas peccary, and javelina. He is a true pig, and in shape resembles that lazy fat fellow in Farmer Brown's barnyard when he was little. You would know him for a pig right away if you should see him, but in every other way, excepting his habit of rooting up the ground with his nose, he is a wholly different fellow. For one thing, his legs, though short, are more slender, and he is a fast runner. There isn't a lazy bone in him, and he is too active to grow fat. His head is large and his nose long, 
and his tail is almost no tail at all. It is just a little rounded knob, as if he had at one time had a tail and it had been cut off. His hair is coarse and stiff, the kind of hair called bristles. From the back of his head along his back, the bristles are long and stout. They are black at the tips, so that he appears to have a black back. When Piggy is angry, he raises these long bristles so that they stand straight up and this gives him a very fierce appearance. His color is so dark a gray that at a distance he appears black. Indeed, he is black on many parts of him. Just back of the neck, a whitish band crosses the shoulders, and this is why he is called the colored peccary. You see, he seems to be wearing a collar. On each jaw are two great pointed teeth called tusks, the two upper ones so long that they project beyond the lips. These tusks are Piggy's weapons, and very good ones they are. The home of Piggy the Peccary is in the hot southwestern part of this country, where live Jaguar and Ocelot, the beautiful spotted members of the cat family. They are two of his enemies. He never likes to be alone, but lives with a band of his friends, and they roam about together. He is found on the plains and among low hills, in swamps and dense forests, and among the thickets of cactus and other thorny plants that grow in dry regions. Plenty of food and shelter from the hot sun seem to be the main things with Piggy. What does he eat? asked Peter Rabbit. Old Mother Nature laughed. It would be easier, Peter, to tell you what he doesn't eat, said she. He eats everything eatable, nuts, fruits, seeds, roots, and plants of various kinds, insects, frogs, lizards, snakes, and any small animals he can catch. Sometimes he does great damage to gardens and crops planted by men. He delights to root in the earth with his nose and often turns over much ground in this way, searching for roots good to eat. On the lower part of his back he carries a little bag of musky scent and from this he gets the name of musk-hog. While, as a rule, he wisely runs from danger, he is no coward, and will fight fiercely when cornered. His friends at once rush to help him and surround the enemy, who is usually glad to climb a tree to escape their gnashing tusks. However, he is not the fierce animal he has been reported to be, ready to attack unprovoked. He will run away if he can. Mr. and Mrs. Peccary have two babies at a time. This is the last of the hoofed animals and the last but one of the land animals of this great country. So you see, we are almost to the end of school. This last one is perhaps the queerest of all. It is Hartshell, the armadillo, and belongs to the order of Edentata, which means toothless. Do you mean to say that there are animals with no teeth at all? asked Happy Jack Squirrel, looking as if he couldn't believe such a thing. Old Mother Nature nodded. That is just what I mean, said she. There are animals without any teeth, though not in this country, and others with so few teeth that they have been put in the same order with the wholly toothless ones. Hardshell the armadillo is one of these. He has no teeth at all in the front of his mouth, and such teeth as he has got 
do not amount to much. But why do you call him Hardshell? asked Peter impatiently. Because instead of a coat of fur, he wears a coat of shell, replied old Mother Nature, and then laughed right out at the funny expressions on the faces before her. It was quite clear that Peter and his friends were having hard work to believe she was in earnest. They suspected her of joking. Do, do you mean that he lives in a sort of house that he carries with him like Spotty the Turtle? ventured Peter. It is a shell, but not like that of Spotty, explained old Mother Nature. Spotty's shell is all one piece, but Armadillo's shell is jointed so that he can roll up like a ball. Spotty isn't a mammal, as are all of you and all those we have been learning about, but is a reptile. Hardshell, the armadillo, on the other hand, is a true mammal. Well, all I can say is that he must be a mighty queer-looking fellow, declared Peter. He is, replied old Mother Nature. He's about the size of Uncle Billy Possum, and if you can imagine a pig of about that size, with very short legs, a long tapering tail, feet with toes and long claws, and a shell covering his whole body, the front of his face and even his tail, you will have something of an idea what he looks like. He lives down in the hot southwest where Piggy the Peccary lives. His coat of shell is yellowish in color and is divided in the middle of his body into nine narrow bands or joints. Because of this, he is called the nine-banded armadillo. In the countries to the south of this, he has a cousin with three bands and another with six. Hartshell's head is very long and he carries it pointed straight down. His small eyes are set far back and at the top of his head are rather large upright ears. The shell of his tail is divided into many jointed rings so that he can move it at will. His tongue is long and sticky. This is so that he can run it out for some distance and sweep up the ants and insects on which he largely lives. His eyesight and hearing are not very good, and having such a heavy, stiff coat, he is a poor runner. But he is a good digger. This means, of course, that he makes his home in a hole in the ground. When frightened, he makes for this, but if overtaken by an enemy, he rolls up into a ball and is safe from all, save those with big and strong enough teeth to break through the joints of his shell. He eats some vegetable matter, and is accused of eating the eggs of ground-nesting birds and of dead, decayed flesh he may find. However, his food consists chiefly of ants, insects of various kinds, and worms. He is a harmless little fellow, and interesting because he is so queer. He is sometimes killed and eaten by men, and his flesh is considered very good. He has from four to eight babies in the early spring. The baby armadillo has a soft, tough skin instead of a shell, and as it grows, it hardens until by the time it is fully grown, it has become a shell. Now, this finishes the lessons about the land animals or mammals. There are other mammals who live in the ocean which is the salt water which surrounds the land and which, I guess, none of you have ever seen. Some of these come on shore and some never do. Tomorrow I will tell you just a little about them 
so that you will know something about all the animals of this great country which is called North America. That is, I will, if you want me to. We do, of course we do, cried Peter Rabbit, and it is plain that he spoke for all. End of chapter 39 Piggy and Heartshell The Peccary or Wild Pig and the Armadillo Recording by Eva Harnick Chapter 40 of the Burgess Animal Book for Children This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Burgess Animal Book for Children by Thornton W. Burgess Chapter 40 The Mammals of the Sea The Sea Otter, Walrus, Sea Lions, Seals, and Manatee, or Sea Cow it was the last day of Old Mother Nature's school in the green forest, and when jolly, round, bright Mr. Sun had climbed high enough in the blue, blue sky to peep down through the trees, he found not one missing of the little people who had been learning so much about themselves, their relatives, neighbors, and all the other animals in every part of this great country. You see, not for anything in the world would one of them willingly have missed that last lesson. I told you yesterday, began Old Mother Nature, that the land is surrounded by water, salt water, sometimes called the ocean, and sometimes the sea. In this live the largest animals in all the great world, and many others, some of which sometimes come on land, and others which never do. One of those which come on land is first cousin to little Joe Otter, and is named the Sea Otter. He lives in the cold waters of the western ocean of the far north. He much resembles little Joe Otter, whom you all know, but has finer, handsomer fur. In fact, so handsome is his fur that he has been hunted for it until now. He is among the shyest and rarest of all animals, and is taken to living in the water practically all the time, rarely visiting land. He lies on his back in the water and gets his food from the bottom of the sea. It is chiefly clams and other shellfish. He rests on floating masses of sea plants. He is very playful, and delights to toss pieces of seaweed from paw to paw as he lies floating on his back. Of course, he is a wonderful swimmer and diver. Otherwise, he couldn't live in the sea. Another who comes on land, but only for a very short distance from the water, is called the walrus. He belongs to an order called Phinipedia, which means fin-footed. Instead of having legs and feet for walking, members of this order have limbs designed for swimming. These are more like fins or paddles than anything else, and are called flippers. The walrus is so big that I can give you no idea how big he is, excepting to say that he will weigh 2,000 pounds. He is simply a great mass of living flesh covered with a rough, very thick skin without hair. From his upper jaw two immense ivory tusks hang straight down, and with these he digs up shellfish at the bottom of the sea. It is a terrible effort for him to move on shore, and so he is content to stay within a few feet of the water. He also lives in the cold waters of the far north amidst floating ice. On this he often climbs out to lie for hours. His voice is a deep grunt or bellowing roar. The young are born on land close to the water. The sea lions belong to the same fin-footed order. The best known of these are the California sea lion and the fur seal, which is not a true seal. The California sea lion is also called the barking sea lion because of its habit of barking, and is the best known of the family. It is frequently seen on the rocks along the shore and on the islands off the western coast. These sea lions are sleek animals, exceedingly graceful in the water. They have long necks and carry their heads high. They are covered with short, coarse hair and have small, sharp-pointed ears. Their front flippers have neither hair nor claws, but their hind flippers have webbed toes. They are able to move about on land surprisingly well for animals lacking regular legs and feet, and can climb on and over rocks rapidly. Naturally, they are splendid swimmers. 
The largest member of the family is the stellar sea lion, who sometimes grows to be almost as big as a walrus. He is not sleek and graceful like his smaller cousin, but has an enormously thick neck and heavy shoulders. His voice is a roar rather than a bark. The head of an old sea lion is so much like that of a true lion that the name sea lion has been given this family. The most valuable member of the family, so far as man is concerned, is the fur seal, also called sea bear. It is very nearly the size and form of the California sea lion, but under the coarse outer hair, which is gray in color, is a wonderful, soft, fine, brown fur, and for this the fur seal has been hunted so persistently that there was real danger that soon the very last one would be killed. Now wise and needed laws protect the fur seals on their breeding grounds, which are certain islands in the far north. The young of all members of this family are born on shore, but soon take to the water. The fur seal migrates just as the birds do, but always returns to the place of its birth. Man and the polar bear are its enemies on land and ice, and the killer whale in the water. Mr. Fur Seal always has many wives, and this is true of the other members of the sea lion family and of the walrus. The males are three or four times the size of the females. Among themselves, the males are fierce fighters. The true seals are short-necked, thick-bodied, and have rather round heads with no visible ears. The walrus and sea lions can turn their hind flippers forward to use as feet on land, but this the true seals cannot do. Therefore, they are more clumsy out of water. Their front flippers are covered with hair. The one best known is the harbor or leopard seal. It is found along both coasts, often swimming far up big rivers. It is one of the smallest members of the family. Sometimes it is yellowish-gray, spotted with black, and sometimes dark brown, with light spots. The ringed seal is about the same size or a little smaller than the harbor seal, and is found as far north as it can find breathing holes in the ice. You know all these animals breathe air just as land animals do. This seal looks much like the harbor seal, but is a little more slender. Another member of the family is the harp, saddleback, or Greenland seal. He is larger than the other two and has a black head and gray body with a large black ring on the back. The female is not so handsome, being merely spotted. The handsomest seal is the ribbon seal. He is about the size of his cousin, the harbor seal. He is also called the harlequin seal. Sometimes his coat is blackish brown and sometimes yellowish gray, but always he has a band of yellowish white, like a broad ribbon, from his throat around over the top of his head, and another band which starts on his chest and goes over his shoulder curves down and finally goes around his body not far above the hind flippers. Only the male is so marked. This seal is rather rare. Like most of the others it lives in the cold waters of the far north. The largest of the seals is the elephant seal, once numerous, but killed by man until now there are few members of this branch of the family. He is a tremendous fellow and has a movable nose which hangs several inches below his mouth. The queerest looking member of the family is the hooded seal. Mr. Seal of this branch of the family is rather large, and on top of his nose he carries a large bag of skin, which he can fill with air until he looks as if he were wearing a queer hood or bonnet. The seals complete the list of animals which live mostly in the water, but come out on land or ice at times. Now I will tell you of a true mammal, warm-blooded, just as you are, and air-breathing, but which never comes on land. This is the manatee, or sea cow. It lives in the warm waters of the sunny south, coming up from the sea in the big rivers. It is a very large animal, sometimes growing as big as a medium-sized walrus. The head is round, somewhat like that of a seal. The lips are thick and big, the upper one split in the middle. The eyes are small. It has but two flippers, and these are set in at the shoulders. Instead of hind flippers, such as the seals and sea lions have, the manatee has a broad, flattened, and rounded tail, which is used as a propeller, just as fish use their tails. The neck is short and large. In the water, the manatee looks black. The skin is almost hairless. 
This curious animal lives on water plants. Sometimes it will come close to a river bank and with head and shoulders out of water feed on the grasses which hang down from the bank. The babies are, of course, born in the water, as the manatee never comes on shore. Now I think this will end today's lesson and the school. Peter Rabbit hopped up excitedly. You said that the largest animals in the world live in the sea, and you haven't told us what they are, he cried. True enough, Peter, replied Old Mother Nature pleasantly. The largest living animal is a whale, a true mammal and not a fish at all, as some people appear to think. There are several kinds of whales, some of them comparatively small, and some the largest animals in the world, so large that I cannot give you any idea of how big they are. Beside one of these, the biggest walrus would look like a baby. But the whales do not belong just to this country, so I think we will not include them. Now we will close school. I hope you have enjoyed learning as much as I have enjoyed teaching, and I hope that what you have learned will be of use to you as long as you live. The more knowledge you possess, the better fitted for your part in the work of the great world you will be. Don't forget that, and never miss a chance to learn. And so ended Old Mother Nature's school in the green forest. One by one, her little pupils thanked her for all she had taught them, and then started for home. Peter Rabbit was the last. I know ever and ever so much more than I did when I first came to you, but I guess that after all, I know very little of all there is to know, he said shyly, which shows that Peter Rabbit really had learned a great deal. Then he started for the dear old briar patch. Lipperty, lipperty, lip. End of chapter 40. End of The Burgess Animal Book for Children by Thornton W. Burgess.